in so much pain, literally just crying. But that's not who I am. That's impermanent. That's impermanent. So this, this reality hit me when I realized that I'm not my body, I'm not my mind, and that all things around me that I'm looking at, from my body to, to yours, to the clothes that I'm wearing, to the microphone or the technology that we're using to communicate right now, to um, the pen that you're jotting notes with, all of these things are impermanent. But what is not impermanent is who we truly are or what is ultimate reality. What is Eden? What is heaven? What is the kingdom of God? What the Buddhists would call nirvana. This is who we truly are. And so I want you to stop for a minute. I simply want you to recognize you are not, if you're not the form, if you're not the mind, what are you? See, what we've been taught, what most people, I know what I was taught growing up within Christianity was that I was this body and mind that is ultimately waiting for resurrection so that I could go to heaven and get a new body. Were you taught anything similar to that? What you realize is that you are not the body that's waiting to get to heaven, but you are heaven waiting to renew the body. The body is an impermanent state. The mind is an impermanent state. You will change your mind over and over and over throughout the course of your life. Your beliefs will come and they will go. They will ultimately transition and change time and time again. Hopefully now that you've been introduced to me, your beliefs will come to an end in the sense of that this is what you believe for identity. And instead you will simply use the beliefs, you will employ those beliefs to create and play in the world around you instead of identifying in those things. See, only when you, if you, as long as you identify in a belief, you will never include all. You will never truly love all. You always stand in judgment. There will always be a line that will ultimately violate the belief that you've identified as. And when you, when someone violates that, you will, ah, I will exclude you. I can't be, I can't be in your life. But see, in the realization that you're more than that, in the realization that you're not the body, that you're not the mind, in the realization that you're not an impermanent object, but that you are the eternal one, that you literally are Eden, that you are the kingdom of God, that you are the space in which all this energy is playing and manifesting and being created and changing and transforming. In this realization of ultimate reality, everything begins to change. And what happened for me, Stephanie, is that when I saw, as I started to realize the ultimate reality of who I truly am, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth, the reason why the truth sets free is because it sets free the body from the shackles of the form. It sh sets free the mind from the shackles of the form or the, from the shackles of false identity. Who you truly are has never needed freedom. The truth has never needed freedom and you are the truth. Just as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you've seen Him, you've seen you. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. As He is, so are you in this world. You are the truth. This word truth is the word aletheia. It simply means reality. I use the word ultimate reality because we, ultimate, we experience many different kinds of reality in this life. We experience perceptual reality. We experience uh, factual reality, what we would call factual, like we're able to touch this as we would call this pink. That's still subjective, but we would call this flower pink. But we experience that kind of reality. Then we experience a very subjective form of reality. What I think is beautiful, Dean might not find beautiful. That sort of reality. I go, wow, look at this beautiful flower. Look at this beautiful person. Dean's like, eh, eh, it's, pre it's pretty, it's cool but he might not find it really beautiful, you know. And so this sort of thing is, is subjective. But then we have ultimate reality, which lies beyond all of that. This ultimate reality is the truth. When you recognize this one truth, who you truly are, then all of a sudden you, are no you will no longer be subjective, subje subjected or imprisoned by the form. You are not that thing.
And in this moment, you are no longer stuck inside the body. You have transcended it. And when you transcend the body, now the body is, being, is able to be that energetic, energetic canvas that you're painting. You as essence are painting on, creating, sculpting, shaping, playing with in the playground that is the world around us. This is so beautiful. So what is ultimate reality? Ultimate reality is singularity in its finest. It's the world or the realm of reconciled opposites. See, in the realization of being, of essence, this is ultimate reality, of spirit, this is ultimate reality. Let me define these terms for you real quick. Janet, if I were to say, are you spirit, would you say yes? Yes. So if you are spirit, I would ask another question and you can simply answer with the nodding of your head. If you are spirit, does spirit die? Does spirit transition? Spirit, does it transition? That's a trickier one for her. Okay. Maybe we'll come back to that. Does, was spirit born? say it doesn't transition it takes on different forms but that we're just talking spirit we're not talking about the forms that it takes on or animates we're just talking about mm -hmm. spirit does spirit transition and the answer would be no spirit doesn't mm -hmm. transition it's not changing its nature does not change then the form that it takes on will change but the nature of spirit does not change right that's why the scriptures in the bible say that um He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's talking about that unchangeable, unshakable reality. Now, that unchangeable, unshakable reality is continually expanding and increasing. Love does not stay, in a, is not in a state of, um, it does not plateau. It continues to increase and expand just as space continues to increase and expand. You with me? So again, I'll ask you, Janet, does, la, does spirit, was spirit born? No, so spirit cannot die. Spirit was not born. Spirit does not change. It can take on form, but it does not change. So we've established that. So if this is spirit and this is who you are, this is the eternal reality of who you are, the eternal reality of who we are, then if you in the realization of this are you moved by a financial crisis <laughs> money comes and goes money will be here one moment it'll be gone tomorrow it comes and goes it's so impermanent will you be moved by a financial crisis if you realize that you are spirit the ever abiding spirit would a financial crisis bother you anyone Austin, would a financial crisis move you? No. When you realize that you are spirit, that you have neither mother nor father because you've never been born, not in the sense of being born, then would you be moved, moved or shaken by the loss of your mother and father? Let me ask a different question. Can you experience loss? The form can. See, that's, that's a challenging one for us. We all stop and we think, oh my God, I'll feel cold-hearted if I say no. The form can experience that loss, can experience the emotions, and there's nothing wrong with experiencing the emotions of, of grief or of sadness for not being... There's nothing wrong with that. You can experience that if you'd like. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm simply suggesting and saying to you that the essence, when you realize that you are spirit, and the true realization that you're spirit, if the mother or father passes away from the form, your husband or wife, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter passes away in form, you are still just as connected. You're still just as one with them as you were before. The experience 
the perceptual experience that you were having in the form changes. That's all that changes. Are you with me? Can you just at least understand that to just even if it's just a small degree, can you understand that? So in other words, essence, spirit is not moved. It's not shaken. It's not like the wind. It's not double-minded. But in this place of reconciled opposites, this place ultimate reality is reconciled opposites. So what does this mean that it's reconciled opposites? What does it mean when the scripture says to the pure, all things are pure? See, what most people, you have to recognize what, it, what pure means for you to recognize that all things are pure. So many say to me, literally um, on uh, one of the Instagram posts today, I was, I think it was today or recently, it all blends together. But I was talking about, uh, I was sharing about um, uh, being the purity or being the, the, the singularity of being pure and seeing that all is good, that all is pure, something along those lines. And somebody is really trying to, I don't know who they are, but they're really trying to wrap their head around this idea. To them, it's an idea. And so I just keep encouraging them to meditate on it. And they're like, but I, this doesn't make sense. And they keep coming back. I'm like, no, no, no. Let go of what you think it means. You can't meditate on something with what you think it means. You have to let go of what you think it means to be able to truly meditate on it. But this idea is very hard for people. So many people within the gray circles of Christianity will say, well, you are, and, and outside of those gray circles of Christianity would often say that if you, those that say to the pure all things are pure, that use that passage of scripture are trying to use it as a license to sin. Have you heard that? They often say they're trying to use that as a license to just do whatever they want to do. Okay. Or the scripture that says, when you live in spirit, you're no longer under law. Well, they're just trying to use that as a license. They're not truly living in spirit. No one really can do that. Okay. This is what they say. But see, they can never comprehend with a rational mind that is stuck in duality what it would look like to not live in duality. I had somebody recently come to me and they said to me, they said, I was talking to them and they said, well, what is... Um, where is all this sin? They were struggling with this idea that, uh, of sin. And, they, and, and, I, and, I, and I said, well, where is all this sin that you're mindful of? They're like, oh, you know, here and here and here. And I said, where did the idea of sin come from? And they, they immediately piped up that being raised in Christian all their life for 50, 60 years of their life. They said, well, sin came from eating of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, it came from being in the garden. And so I simply said, okay, where did it come from? It came from the knowledge of good and evil, correct? I said, yes. They said, yes. I said, okay, where did law come from? And they said, I guess law came from the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I said, okay, you think that we need law to be able to live a holy life, and yet what you're telling me is that the place that law came from is actually what caused the sin. And they're like, no, 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 no. I said, no, no, you've, you said that. Uh, let's just get clear. You're, this is what you're saying. Then they changed the conversation. <laughs> they changed the topic of conversation quickly, and I just celebrated them. It's like, okay, awesome. You know, yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to get it. It's okay. But can you see that? That when you return to a place of singularity, now when you are able to truly see just one the ultimate reality of who you truly are as spirit, there is nothing impure. What we call impure is f temporal, isn't it? Is there anything eternal that is impure? If a rotten tree, you can say, well, that tree is rotten. As an example, someone could look at a tree and say, that tree is rotten, it's impure. Well, that tree, see, no, what's impure is your idea. Your concept is impure. Shanna, when that tree changes form, when the form leaves, and now all that is left and it returns into the ground and now it's the energy that's giving fuel to the ground and, and giving nourishment to the ground so that another tree can come in its place. But when that rot is gone because it has been 
transformed, can you call it impure? You can't even any longer call it a tree, can you? So how could you say it's impure? If a child molester, somebody that you've identified as a child molester and you've identified as evil, when that person's body is gone, would you still call them evil? They are not there any longer. The person that did those things is no longer there to even be called evil because that has never been who they truly are. Who they are is beyond that altogether. They, if they do not realize who they are, will continue to act out of a place of impurity, of duality, of good and evil, right and wrong. But in the realization that you are that singular I am, in the realization that you are that pure spirit, is there any longer the good and evil, the right and wrong? No, there's reconciled opposites. So, it creates a, a world in which you live where you see that all things really are pure, Kevin. Where you look around, you're like, ah, out of this place of the purity of life, out of the purity of spirit, I look around and I go, ah, oh, it's so beautiful, so pure. Everything is so beautiful. Everything is so beautiful. It's pure. This is the pure land. The pure land is only realized within. It's the eternal world, not the temporal one that you are frustrated in, not the temporal one that is moving you. It is the eternal world that I'm speaking of. And in this place of this eternal world, in this pure land, you begin to realize ah, everything is pure. And you stop making so many subjective judgments. You stop hanging on to opinions. People hang on to their opinions as if they actually matter. But like winter and autumn, they will fade away too. Have opinions, celebrate your opinions and celebrate the opinions of others, but hold them loosely. Your opinion really doesn't matter. My opinion really doesn't matter. And make no room for negative opinions in your mind. If you're going to have an opinion, have a positive one. So what this ultimate reality begins to do in the realization of who I truly am, of who you truly are, of this ultimate reality, you are able to be, you are then set free from being imprisoned or stuck. What I, the, I'd like to use the word stuck inside your own body stuck in this identified form, imprisoned in an identified mindset, imprisoned in the past and future mind, and you're free. You're beyond what is to be present. So as long as you are in form, you will seek to be present. How many of you guys like the feeling of being present? And so many are still on a journey of being present. I want to be present. I'm practicing mindfulness to be present. I'm practicing walking meditation or meditation to be present. I'm doing these things. I'm breathing. I'm doing whatever it is in this, in seeking, really being present. And you really seek being present as long as there's a past and future mind that's trying to pull you away. Isn't this true? And so when you're experiencing this past mind, it's always projecting into the future. Past mind and future mind are really the same mind. But it's a dual mind. And when you're experiencing this mind pulling you away where you feel stress, if, you ever feel, if you've ever feel stress, this is the fruit of living as a, the past mind. The past and the future mind. If you feel frustrated, it's the fruit of living as the past or future mind. If you feel bored, My kids have a hard time with this one. It's the fruit of past or future mind. Who you truly are has never been bored. 
You cannot be everywhere and be bored. But see, this one that is still being pulled away, this mindset that's still being pulled away by past or future mind seeks to be present because they recognize that being present is where freedom from this past or future mind lies. Isn't this true? But I would like to simply draw your attention to this one thing. The past and future mind and being present are actually just two sides of the same coin. The present mind is simply the other side of the past and future mind's coin. Just two sides of the same coin. Which one are you? Are you the one that is present or are you the one that is non-present? You're neither. The one that you are is neither non-present or present. The one that you truly are is the presence. Presence has never had to be present. This is who you truly are. This is ultimate reality. So I thought, as most of you are doing or have done, to be present, to abide in Christ. What it looked like to be present for the vast majority of my life. Only to one day wake up to the realization, holy shit. <laughs> I, I woke up to the realization, I was like, ah, oh, you mean I've never had to be present one time in my life. I've been working so hard to be present and it's not necessary at all. Yes, this is exactly what I'm saying to you. As a matter of fact, if you truly want to be present, you must stop trying. The more you try to be present, the less present you are. Isn't that true? Have you ever really thought to be present? Like you're trying, you're pressing in. I'm going to let go of that. I'm going to let go of that. Now all your focus on is actually not present at all. You're completely unaware of the things that are actually taking place in the perceptional world around you. You're completely unaware of this moment that you're actually in, that the body, that the form is actually in. So can we simply say this? To be present-minded is for the body, for the form. Being present-minded is beautiful. And it's much more beautiful than being non-present. Both of those things are about the form. If you're non-present, you will have stress. If you're present-minded or if you are mindful, we'll use the word mindful. If you are mindful, Austin, you will, no long, you will not be stressed. You will not be worried. You will not be fearful. But what I'm saying to you is this. That exists only for the body. Who you truly are is presence. In this realization, you no longer wage this war going back and forth between non-present and present. You will simply bring forth the present one. I will be mindful. I choose that. Who is the I that's choosing that? Essence, spirit, choosing mindfulness. For essence or spirit does not have the opportunity. In the singular place of existence, it doesn't. It can only recognize this one thing, that in duality, non-presence and presence are two sides of the same coin. So it doesn't see non-present as evil. It just sees non-present as creating something that's not so much fun. It's creating your own misery. So why would you do that? You can choose to do that if you'd like. I will love you just the same. So what I'm saying is this, as long as you've identified as the form, you will continue, as that impermanent form, you will continue to wage the battle. This is the reason why within every religious culture there is spiritual warfare or battle. But let me explain this to you. It is not actually spiritual at all. In spirit there is no war. This is simply a lower level or a mental level of warfare. It's you waging a war between what is real and what is not. In the dual world trying to figure out what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil. The moment you realize that you are the tree of life and not living in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you are set free. The moment you realize what is ultimate reality and what is not ultimate reality, you are set free. What is that freedom for? That freedom is so that you can now begin to animate and play in the world of reconciled opposites instead of being dictated to by them. This will probably be something that you want to listen to a couple of times. That you want to listen to a couple of times and meditate on. Because you're not going to, don't listen to it and think you got it. Don't listen to it and think you got it. I don't even do this. The reason why it's so important to realize who you are not is because anytime you have an experience or a feeling that does not what you want, if you have a 
a feeling of misery, a feeling of insecurity, a feeling of lack, a feeling of loss, a feeling of stress, a feeling of anxiety. A feeling. These feelings are great. These are wonderful feelings. Because they're revealing that your consciousness, that you've become conscious more of the physical form and of the impermanent thing than you have of that of then of awareness that you're simply that you're simply stepping forward and stepping more into awareness or ah, still awakening it's okay we're realizing the truth it's okay it's a good place to be it's not a bad place don't beat yourself up i haven't got it i'll never get it you're right the ego will never get it ego can't get it who you've identified as cannot get it who you believe you are will never get what i'm saying what I'm saying will only frustrate who you think you are. <laughs> Can you attest to that? Ultimate reality, really, truly awakening, realizing who we are, the truth. Then as the truth, you begin to set free those simply and effortlessly begin to set free others because they are also the truth hidden imprisoned in form but as long as you believe you are flesh and blood you cannot inherit the kingdom the ego cannot inherit the kingdom it can never see the kingdom only who you truly are can see the kingdom only who you truly are, essence and spirit, only essence, only spirit, only the eternal reality of who you truly are can inherit kingdom, can experience kingdom, will see kingdom. This is it. See, as long as you are identified as the form, you always see an angel with a, a big lightsaber keeping you from the Garden of Eden. But in the realization that you're not the form, the angel vanishes into the imaginary realm that it came from. Because there is no separation. There's no you and me, there's no you and Eden. There's no you that's trying to get to the kingdom, that's trying to apprehend or attain kingdom. This you does not exist. It is just a belief. There's no you that's separated from my love. There's no that you that ever could be. That you can say again, they can, you can, that you could do anything. Many, many of those identities have done many things, have said many things about me, have done many things. They cannot separate themselves from me. So we've all, we are one. The ultimate reality of who we are, we are one, one spirit together with him. Hey guys, thanks for watching our video. Give us a thumbs up, comment, thoughts, questions in the section below. Let us know what you want to hear from us. Subscribe to our channel for more life-changing content. And as always, check the section below for our website, for live events, where we'll be, what we're up to, more about us, and our online school website is listed below as well. We love you. We're glad you're here. We want to hear from you. We're in this with you.